Welcome to the Faded Spade Podcast with your hosts, Tom Wheaton and Sean McCormick. Welcome to the next episode of the Faded Spade Podcast. My name is Tom Wheaton, founder and CEO of Faded Spade. With our co-host, Sean McCormick, the poker boss. So, Sean, what up, man? So, first and foremost, where can people find the Faded Spade podcast? Let's hit them with it early. Hold on. Let me check my notes here. (laughs) It looks like they can find our podcast on a lot of different places, like places I didn't even know they could find it now. So, it's pretty cool. Um, We have a Faded Spade YouTube channel. We also uh, have... It available on Apple Play, um, Spotify, all the different podcast um, spaces. And then, of course, where else but FadedSpade.com. You can go there and find this podcast. That's right. We've got a special page, FadedSpade.com slash podcast. It'll get you links to everywhere the audio versions are housed and our brand new YouTube page. We appreciate you guys subscribing and showing that support. Glad to hear all the great feedback from people over the last few weeks about the content. So thank you very much. As always, on FadedSpade.com, using code PODCAST, we'll get you 15% off any order. So there we go. All the promo stuff is wrapped up and out of the way, Sean. Let's get on to the episode. Let's do it. And what a great guest we have today. So continuing our entrepreneurial story theme here with the Founder Hour, we have an unbelievable guest. Uh, Many of you may know her as the host and anchor of the World Poker Tour, plus some of the acting she does in and outside of the poker industry. That said, you may not know her impressive business background, which includes a business called Tulum Tan, which you'll hear all about today on the podcast. She's even involved in a permaculture farm in Mexico. You'll learn all about what that is. And even a restaurant in Australia. She's a social media influencer. Um, And if you don't know who I'm talking about yet, we're talking about the lovely and talented Lynn Gill Martin, who is coming on the show to share her entire entrepreneurial and career story, which Sean full of surprises. I thought an unbelievable episode. And again, continually embodies what we're trying to do here with the Faded Spade podcast. How did you enjoy our time with Lynn? Seriously, like, uh, Lynn is like my first like poker crush. (laughs) I'm glad you just said that. Can I say say that? Uh, It's not like my wife doesn't know. I think my wife has a crush on her too. Who doesn't have a crush on Lynn Gil Martin? She's so awesome. Um, Her story was absolutely amazing. What really gets me is the fact that I'm 40 years old and nine-year-old Lynn was where I am today. It's just scary. Like she was meant for the big stage. She was meant to just be awesome. And uh, I hope a lot of people get inspired by her story. And uh, I know I was. And, uh, I, I, you know, talking to these guests, like you said, this is the point of the podcast. Like if we could reach just one person that this energizes, inspires, engages, and makes them want to take over the world. That's awesome because that's how I feel when I'm done talking to these guests. So it's kind of selfish, but I kind of like what we're doing, buddy. Hey, man, it's built out of, just like Faded Spade is built out of pure poker passion. You know, so is our podcast. It's why we started it. And, and you're right. And I think people will see that and hear that in Lynn's podcast. I mean, we're not going to give it all away now, obviously, because it's just a great story and best told by her. But One thing I would summarize this whole time with her as is she is someone that is truly living out her dreams, right? And the story of how she got there is really cool. Um, And just a lot of risk taking, a lot of going with the flow, a lot of jumping on opportunity, but all comes back to her roots, as you'll hear about when she was a kid that she kind of lost a little bit of and later refound in her life. So really cool story. The Lynn Gill Martin entrepreneurial, uh, Faded Spade Founder Hour coming right up. So before we jump into that, I mentioned TulumTan.com. You can use code AMIGAS and you'll get 30% off um, any Tulum Tan product, which is actually really great because all the prices, uh, all the prices are Australian. And that's already like a 33% discount for us. So I did not want to forget to mention that. She did not ask us to mention it, but we're going to go ahead and give her that shout out. I think we should mention that you need to use her product immediately. I'm just it's saying. the lighting. I have, you know, bright light, not warm. I mean, you live in Florida. Get a tan, buddy. <laughs> I think I might have to actually use Tool and Tan. We'll see. So, actually, I actually already put in, put in an order. 
Ooh. Yeah, and I said it's for Devin, and of course Devin will use it. But I'm probably going to lather up the old dome here. It, it'll it'll be uh, it'll be like you know like 1 a.m. You've already put the kids to sleep. You're in the bathroom by yourself, just yeah, stuff on or doing whatever you're doing. And next podcast, when I look just like you know you, <laughs> people know it's tool of death. I have no words. <laughs> no words. So and you know what? We are done with words. We are going to go ahead and stop this intro, and we're going to roll into what everybody is interested in, the Faded Spade Founder Hour with Lynn Gale Martin, coming up. Founder Hour. All right. As you just heard, we are here for the Founder Hour interview segment with our awesome guest, Ms. Lynn Gale Martin. What is up, Lynn? Hi, guys. How's it going? Uh, I'm good. I'm in New York City at the moment, so excuse the the bed <laughs> in the setting. I'm just in a hotel room, and it's all about getting that good light. So I have to face the window. So this is my environment. You figured it out. <laughs> we should have called you before we did this, because if you saw any of our first pilot episodes, the lighting was horrible, and it's still not great, but it works. No, it works. You guys are good. But yes, it's all about the audio and the lighting. They're the two most important things in video. Uh hundred percent. And then it's hard with the bald head, you know, I got to put on makeup like we do during our interviews. But anyway, so thanks for joining us. Like I know we're going to get into your whole entrepreneurial career story, which is so cool. I think most people, you know, know you as, you know, the host of the World Poker Tour and an actress, but there's a whole other business side to Lynn Gilmartin that I'm really excited for people to hear about. So, but before all that, you just got back from the WPT cruise. So tell us about that. Oh, it was, you know, my expectations were pretty high because our itinerary was epic. Uh, it was the first time that we had a cruise through the Mediterranean. We left out of Barcelona. We went through France and, and Italy and back again. And even though my bar was so high, I was still blown away. It was just the best experience. Like we got off every day at a new city oh, wow. uh, and at, like we just go and explore, you know, the south of France. And then we get back on the ship, uh, all have dinner together in the big, ballroom like we're on the Titanic and then go down to the poker room and play you know whether it's a free role or the main event or a ladies event or a high roller there was a different event every night and then you know and it's just so lighthearted and fun everyone is just there to really enjoy themselves it's not you know high stakes poker so we were all just having great banter at the tables and and just talking about our day exploring Europe that day and what everyone's doing the next day and then comparing plans and teeing up plans together and making new friends and it's just a really really nice week so cool i've got to hit one of those up warren and david uh invited me like last year or something and i couldn't make it but it sounds like an unbelievable time oh, and really did nice. i did i read that you final table to tournament as well i did a final table the ladies event oh get it but i didn't cash though <laughs> what <laughs> i know only i think five places paid and i came seventh which looks but i final tabled Moving on, final <laughs> table of the tournament, damn it. So, all right, so let's jump into this, Lynn. So, all right, so, you know, the, the whole purpose of this Faded Spade podcast is to share the entrepreneurial and career stories, right? So, so take us back to little Lynn, right? Where'd you grow up? Where are your roots? And like, um, how did you kind of get on this path to where you are today? Well, I, I was born in Ireland, oh. um, but when I was, yeah, you didn't expect that one. I know that, no. When I was a baby, my, uh, my dad had a great career opportunity and we were brought out to Australia by a big manufacturing company. Um, and it was supposed to just be for five years. And we moved, my parents, my brother and I moved to Melbourne and we never left. <laughs> it's just such an amazing country. So we stayed there. So I've always resonated as Australian because it's all I've ever known. It's the only accent I've ever had. My parents still have their Irish accent, but um, yeah. So I grew up in Australia and um, it's funny when I was a kid, I, I have always uh, just known how to do my own thing. Maybe it's cause I'm like the youngest child and I just kind of I don't know, just took care of myself or something. But um, I always wanted to be an actress. It's all I ever wanted. So right. for, uh, from before I can remember, I used to put Dirty Dancing on replay at home and just pretend I was baby and <laughs> just spin around the house all the time. And I would put on performances for my family and make them watch me do some dance routine or something. Um, and mum says I was about nine. 
I, I, when I was about nine, like, so I, actually I would always do all my own research and I would just go to mum and say, this is the acting school I want to go to. This is the time. And this is how much it is here. Let's go. Right. So she never had to do any research for me from so young. And, uh, I would just like, this is what I want to do now. And this is where we're, this is where we're going to go. And so when I was around nine or 10, maybe, um, I had had my first headshot taken from my acting school. And then suddenly I just walk into the kitchen to mum with a folder and it was all like photocopies of my headshot and my resume and my cover letter and, and a whole list of all the agents in Melbourne and envelopes ready to go. And I was like, mum, we need to send these off. Oh my gosh. Like, <laughs> you did that? You had the initiative to do that at nine years old? It was like, yes, I would have been, I, I think I, I think I was more like 11, but yeah. it was primary school. Like I was so young. Wow. Uh, and so I just, I think it's just always been, oh, you know what else I did? I, I borrowed the family camera um, again around this age and I, I, I snuck it into my, um, my bedroom. And you know, when back then, like the cameras are so big and I snuck it into my bedroom and I set it up. And I remember, I remember making this, I had the best idea. I was like, oh, I have figured out how TV is made. And so I got the camera and I put it there and I had this whole script of stuff. Like, I don't know if it was like news headlines or what. And I, for some reason decided to wear sunglasses and I was wearing sunglasses and I recorded myself just as like a news anchor hosting something. And then I got this red t-shirt, which was going to work as my red, uh, my red, uh, curtain. And then I had handwritten the credits and in my head, the way I visualized it, I thought this is I figured it out. This is how the credits are made. And I held up the credits like written by Lynn Gilmartin, hosted by Lynn Gilmartin. And I dragged them down the screen like this <laughs> as credits. I remember playing it back going, oh, that doesn't look as good as I thought it would. But I was so young and I just, I've, so I've just always had it in my head of like, I know how to make stuff happen and I'll just go and do it. So while <laughs> you were doing this, like what was your mum's rea- mum, right? Not mom, mum. What was your mum's <laughs> reaction during all this? And like, what kind of support did she provide you? Oh, amazing support. My parents have been so good. I think they've always had a good laugh and really enjoyed my self-sufficiency. And so then they're like, sure. And so whenever I said to them, this is the new thing I'm enrolling in, they'll be like, okay. And then they'll take me. And so that was the great thing too. I, they never um, uh, deterred me from any direction I ever wanted to go. They always encouraged whatever it was uh, that I wanted to take up in that moment and allowed me to explore all these different parts of myself and, um, really encourage that. And that has definitely helped me get to where I am at the moment for sure to take some scary jumps and leaps and risks. And yeah. Unbelievable. So, okay. So, so that was like, you know, let's call it middle school, right? Let's, let's Mm -hmm. call it middle school. So do you remember past middle school, high school, you know, when did you start really getting like opportunities for hosting or acting or et cetera? Well, I was in a couple of plays and um, I got like one of the lead roles in sixth grade and it was the best experience and I just loved it. And that's just what I wanted to do. But then I was in another play and I would have been about 12, I think at the time. And I was playing multiple characters. And so I had different uh, uh, costume changes. And I remember I had to run off the stage at the end of one scene and I was wearing socks and I had just a sheet tied around me and my other costume was underneath thankfully. Um, and so the sheet had come untied and my sock, my sock got caught in the sheet. And as I was running off stage, I just went up in the air and fell like on my butt so hard in the front row center of the stage. (laughs) And I remember there was like these 16 year old boys in the front row and I could hear them all erupting with laughter and I could see them. And I was mortified. I cried for like two weeks and, uh, that was the end of my acting career (laughs) at that age. I, uh, Because it was kind of like that and then combined in Australia, we have this thing called tall poppy syndrome. If you dare dream big as a, it's it's more as a child, like in the school ground, um, you get cut down. Uh, Like how, how, yeah, it's, it's not nice. Um, It's kind of like, how dare you think so good of yourself, you know? And so, so I was, I would always get a little bit teased if I ever said, I want to be an actress. And the response always was like, what? No, you no. And I started to believe that I got that sort of bullying that combined with the falling over. I was like, that's it. I'm, this is not a realistic dream. And once I hit high school, I decided I wanted to get a real job, go to university, wear a suit and work in the city. That was my, (laughs) that was my goal as a a young uh, teenager. And I did that. So then I, you know, I, I kind of, um, 
just focused on going to university and I got my marketing degree and I loved that. Like that was fantastic. And I'm really grateful that my life played out that way that I didn't just completely focus on the um, performing arts side of things. And I got the sort of more of the business background, which is why we're here talking today. So now I kind of have those two aspects of me, I guess. So that's, that's amazing. So tell us about that time in your life. So where'd you go to university and, and how did you know you like wanted to go down this path of, of business and marketing? Um, I, I chose, it's funny, you know, I just, I didn't, I was like, I, I'm so evenly balanced, right brain, left brain. And my subjects in high school that I had chosen, it, I had really kind of, see, I went to a high school that was really, really creative. Mm. Um, and I didn't realize that I was creative. I'd kind of sh- sort of shut down that part of me. And I always thought that I was just a completely non-creative person. And that I was just, you know, I, I took um, accounting, legal studies, psychology, math and computer science. Like they were my subjects at school and English. And, uh, even though there was a drama class, there was a music and there was art, they were all incredible artists. Like the art class, they were all creating murals. Like they were insane artists. And because I compared myself to those and then to these incredible performers in the drama class, because they were all musically trained and I'm not, I was like, well, I'm not an actor. I'm not an artist. I'm not any of these things. And I just convinced myself that I am this more analytical, like business minded accountant. You know, I thought I wanted to be an accountant. I thought I wanted to be a law clerk. I I don't know. I was just going through all these different options and I was just at open days. And um, I remember I just learning about what public relations was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that was the first, uh, the, so I was like, Oh, that sounds fun. My dad described, he goes, you basically have long lunches with lots of cool people. And I was like, Oh, I want to do that. (laughs) That's a good description. (laughs) It's a really good description. Yeah. And so I went and studied PR first and um, I did enjoy that, which actually was super helpful for me now too, because I was learning a little bit of what, how journalism works, but just from the other side of it. And that has played into my, my role today. Um, but it wasn't a degree. It was um, a diploma and I wanted to get a degree. I'd convinced myself I need to go to university. So that gave me credits to my marketing degree. So then I just continued on to business um, in, in university and, yeah. I just sort of was taking it all as it came. I don't That's know. It was never like, I want to be in marketing. There was kind of never that, but yeah, I just sort of, I go with the flow a lot. That's great. I need to learn from that. So, okay. <laughs> so, so all of a sudden you have your degree, right? And mm-hmm. what's next? So uh, I've always been a bit of a hustler and uh-huh. I've always had many, many, many jobs and all at once. Like I've held jobs for a long time, but I've had Angel, my boyfriend always laughs at me. He's like, I've never met anyone who has had as many jobs as you have. <laughs> but that sounds terrible because it sounds like I can't hold down a job, but I just was always working at different events and I was doing all kinds of uh, just random stuff. And uh, while I was at university, uh, I had been working at the Australian Open and just as a random like event type role just during the event. And then my manager, she was the marketing, uh, she ran the marketing department and she needed an assistant, which was during the summer holidays. And so that's what kind of nudged me from my PR into marketing actually was because then I started working for her, which was the perfect setup at college uh, to have this summer job uh, for three months working for the Australian Open. And so I was learning how marketing worked and and what kind of goes behind it. And I really enjoyed that. And I, um, I kind of just went down that direction and then it was through a contact. I just got, I got really lucky just from the networking that I had been doing. Cause I just kept putting myself out there, just going uh, and, and, and signing up to random events, whether it was just doing the guest list at the door or greeting people. Um, there were some pretty cool things uh, that I got to do, but, um, and it was from there that I then uh, got a, an opportunity working as a marketing assistant as soon as I graduated at Crown. And I knew nothing about the casino world, poker, nothing. But that was where my introduction came in, was my marketing uh, job at, at, at the casino. Wild. So I didn't know that because I was going to ask, like, when the heck did you get introduced to this whole poker industry, right? Because <laughs> I was like, is that even a part of your life before then? So, okay, so Crown was your first marketing assistant job, right? Yes. So, did you love the industry at first? Did you, were you fascinated by it? Or were you kind of like, eh, we'll see what's up. Like, what was that experience like? I loved it. Yeah. I will never forget the first day when I was given the tour of the casino. Cause it's a beautiful casino. And I was just so, uh, 
I just love, you know, it was just like, wow, this is amazing. You know, I just loved walking through there. And then throughout my entire uh, time working there, I still would always just be like, oh, this is amazing. I like, work here. This is so cool. Um, but I remember the first time I walked through a poker room and I'd never been in a poker room before and I didn't know anything about it. And when they uh, said to me, just some passing comment, like, yeah, there's probably about $100,000 uh, in cash sitting on that table right now. My mind was blown. Like I could not believe it. I'd never seen money like that in my life, even though it was in the form of chips. Like just, I could not understand how that was possible. And so it was just always so intriguing. And um, I was working across all different table games, but it was poker was the fun department. Like I, that was where all the fun stuff was. It was more like the sport side, you know, and um, there was just fun events. It was always like celebrity events and charity things. And then, you know, the big uh, tournament series that would happen, it was just like, you know, uh, any other sporting event. So I always enjoyed working on that. And I ended up moving into just poker. And that was really the beginning of my world, my, my journey here. Is that when you started playing too? You know, I didn't actually, no. because I, I spent so much time in the poker room, but when you work at a casino, you can't play. No. And there's only one casino per state in Australia. So I was, the first time I ever played at a live poker table was in Vegas. Got it. Got mm -hmm. it. We were just talking about that with Andrew Nimi, who was on, on the pot on the podcast. He was talking about how sometimes for his meetup games, like it's their first time going to a casino and playing. So what was your experience like, like your first time sitting down at the table and playing? Were you nervous? Were you excited? Like, what was that like? I was terrified. Yeah. And I think I punted $300. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, first, the first time I played was at the Mirage. I lost like two buy-ins. It was crazy. Oh, really? Like, oh crap. <laughs> I think I was playing like 50 cent a dollar. So I probably didn't punt that much. I think it was at the M casino. That's where I played the first time. Got and it. I think, actually, yeah, something like that. All right. So you're growing at the crown in your career, right? You're loving the industry. It's electric. You're getting into poker. When did this whole transition happen from like that side of the business to, you know, getting involved to the whole with WPT or I think maybe was it poker news too? Like yeah. talk to us about that whole transition. Yeah. So, um, in my corporate life, that was back when YouTube was new, which is so crazy to think that we lived in an existence before YouTube. Mm -hmm. Um, so no one really understood the idea of online content. That was such a new area. And my manager at the time, she was very forward thinking and, um, she wanted, she had seen what poker news was doing and wanted to kind of recreate it and take advantage of whenever we had celebrities in the poker room, but no one knew what it was. So she couldn't pitch to get the budget approved to make some YouTube videos like what? So um, we couldn't hire a host or anything. So she was like, Linny, you're going to do it. And so gave me uh, a microphone and I had to interview these, you know, Australian celebrities and I was terrified and I had no idea what I was doing and they are mortifying to watch. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but I loved it. And this really just reignited this old thing that was in me from when I was younger, like, Oh my God, this is what I've just, I just love performing in any way that I can. And, uh, I just had a blast. I loved doing that. And that was just kind of, um, yeah, it just reignited that spark. And so poker news then they they would come out for the events and they needed someone in the Asia Pacific region. The timing was just amazing. There weren't too many um, hosts that, that, that knew poker down in that area and they'd saw what I'd been doing. And my boss was amazing and was giving the nudge of encouragement and kind of like teed up a meeting with broken news, even though, you know, I was working for her. She just loved it. She was just the best support. And um, yeah. And then I was able to, quit my job, which was a terrifying moment. And I'm so proud of myself actually for doing this because, I, and I think it took about a week or two to do it. And this is again, where my parents' encouragement comes back again. I was in this spot in my life. It was right after the global financial crisis. There's all these stories about how it's so hard to get a job. I had a super, super secure um, corporate career. I was climbing this ladder. My future looked bright. It looked amazing on paper, but then I had this opportunity to quit jump on a plane to Vegas. I'd never been to the United States before to work for a website that I really knew nothing about in a game that I knew absolutely nothing about. Really. It looked like I did cause I was in the poker room, but I'd never played it. And, um, yeah, it was just a terrifying move, but it, that's when I, I remember sitting with my mum one night and she was just like, close your eyes and just, I want you to imagine 
two circles. One is staying where you are. One is taking this job and close your eyes and just step into that circle. Don't think about anything else. Just how think about nothing other than how do you feel, which like, you know, which one makes you feel incredible, you know, like which one do you feel the most excited by? And of course it was the one that was the big scary one, which was flying to Vegas. Oh, of course. Um, yeah. And so I did that and it has paid off. So, <laughs> Here I still a, am. You bring up a really good, a good point, right? So I want to, I want to, I want to go back to a couple of things because for the folks that are listening to this, right. Or watching it, there are going to be people who have that time in their life where it's like, I've got to pick a road. And there might be the safe and secure road and then there might be the risk road. So for people who are in that situation, like what advice would you give them to, to kind of figure out their path? Making big decisions is always so scary like that. Right. And especially when it's a financial risk and you know, you, you have a family to feed and all there's so many factors to, to consider, but life is so short. And, um, I just really, I really just want to live my life in a way that I enjoy every single day and that every day is fun. And I'm doing something that I believe in and that I enjoy. And that gives me freedom to be as creative and expressive as I want to be. And if we are in a job, um, that, sucks our energy that we don't enjoy, then life sucks. Mm -hmm. And then you can't deliver. Um, yeah. Okay. You you just can't be the best version of yourself for your family or for anyone else in your world or for yourself. And that's really what's just so important. Really like it. And it is always hard when you're weighing it up against, um, bills and, and it, you know, so it's not always just so easy to go, I'm just going to go and do this. So you do have to weigh things up, but what, yeah, it, you just have to do what you love. You have to go towards that scary direction sometimes. Amen. And I, yeah, I trust that it will pay off. <laughs> Amen. You know, and, and it's funny because there's been similar advice from our other guests too, who have taken that leap like you did. Right. And it's like, what's the worst that could happen? You go back to what was comfortable because yeah. you don't get back to the corporate world or et cetera. You can always find another job like that. Um, so kudos to you for taking that huge risk. And it sounds like your, your mom was really supportive and, and, you know, helped you that decision-making. I feel like it's unbelievable advice she gave you in terms of the vision. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I'm so, I'm so grateful that, cause that's terrifying for parents to their 23 year old daughter, just being like, Hey guys, I'm going to fly across the other side of the world for a few months. See ya. and quitting my job. Like that's, <laughs> but they just saw how much it lit me up and they, they, they also, they knew that that was something that's always been in me from as it, from a child. So it wasn't yep. so left of center, like, Oh yeah, this is, she's, she's going back to her roots. This is what she wants to do. So we have to let her go. So your spark was reignited, right? You kind of yes. found your, your love for creativity and acting or, or hosting or et cetera. It's like you just found it again. Um, you get to Vegas. So, I mean, how long is that flight? It's 15 hours, Melbourne to LA. Okay. And you're on your own, right? Did you, did you fly on your own? Yeah. (laughs) What was that flight like? (laughs) What's going through your mind? And then like, how were your first few months in Vegas? Terrifying. (laughs) I cried a lot. It was overwhelming. Um, I'll never forget the first day when I got off the plane and I, uh, Someone had picked me up and took me and dropped me off at where I was staying. And then, but I had no uh, SIM card for my phone yet. I had no American dollars. I just was like, whoa. And I, I was staying at, I think they're called the Manhattan Apartments. It's down near South Point in Vegas. But it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. There's just nothing around. And I knew nothing about Vegas. I didn't realize that that's the the way it's laid out. So I just thought I could, I didn't sort myself out at the airport. I just thought I could walk somewhere and figure it out. And I just had no idea what I just was walking in the middle of the desert and everything was getting further and further. The more I kept walking towards it, I'm like, what, where am I? I just, I, what, <laughs> I just landed. Have I landed on the moon? Like I just felt so lost. Um, but I figured it out, you know, over time and, uh, working at the series, I remember just walking in there and just being like, Oh my God, this is just, this is huge. And I just had so much to learn. I had 
thrown myself into such a deep end that I had no idea how deep it was until I got there. It was very overwhelming. But I, that's kind of how I, uh, I, I, I just, I figured it out. It took a while and it was stressful and it was scary. And yeah, but I just, I swam, thankfully. Oh, there you go. And how many, <laughs> how many years were you with Poker News? Four. Four years. Okay. And did you go from Poker News right to WPT or, or tell us that whole kind of adventure? I did. I remember I got a phone call of a lifetime out of nowhere from WPT. Um, I guess you could say Poker News was kind of like my four year audition. Mm -hmm. And um, when WPT was starting uh, Alpha 8, uh, and it was, you know, it was this additional show, and they wanted to have a whole new lineup um, for the cast to sort of stand it apart from the main show, um, they contacted me and offered me the role of, of being the anchor of Alpha 8 and I couldn't believe it. I was just like, oh, you've got to be kidding. This is, this is such a dream. And that kind of then uh, snowballed because then uh, in, into even a bigger role because then they realized that I was producing all of my own stuff um, at Poker News. So then they asked, can I, will I also come on as a producer? Wow. And yeah, so I st not only was my first big US television role as the host, but I was also a producer. Um, and so my role was to create segments, getting to know the players. And that's what I've been doing for, for so long. Um, and, and showing off the locations that we were at. Um, and then very soon after that, then um, the timing was just incredible for me. Uh, Kimberly Lansing, who was the anchor before me, she had fallen pregnant again for her second child. And so she decided to move on and not continue as the anchor on World Poker Tour. So then they thought, well, actually, this would actually be perfect as this connection as if our anchor is the same on both shows and just different commentators, it's enough to stand apart, but yet connect it. And so then they offered me the role of the anchor on WPT as well. And I just three times <laughs> I had phone calls where when I got off it, I was jumping up and down literally in the house. Like, is this real life? What is going on? Oh my God. <laughs> so yeah, that's how that happened. And that was, that was almost seven, that's six and a half years ago. And I was going to ask like, how did poker news and what you're doing at poker news prepare you for it? Like how did, how did, how did that experience prepare you for it? They, it prepared me in such an amazing way because the lower the budget of a project that you work on, the more hats that you wear. Right. And I was doing almost everything in terms of the video production, except for the filming of myself. And, you know, I even sometimes learned how to edit and I would edit some little basic things. I loved watching um, our, our editors because uh, I just love learning the whole picture. I just really enjoy understanding how everything comes together. And um, I just, I just, I don't want to just learn one part of it. I want to know how it works and understand. And so um, because I learned how to produce and how to write, how to hunt down people, how to just sort of do all of that, it, and I even learned how to do my own hair and makeup and all of those things. So when I then started at World Poker Tour, it was so funny. I remember that my first day of filming because I'm stepping into this job that's so much like bigger. It's this grander role and a grander stage. Yet I was doing so much less. I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was just like, hang on a minute. There's someone there to do my hair and makeup. There was someone there who was writing my script. There was someone there who would go and get the player and bring him over to me for the interview. You know, I, I was used to running around myself and doing all of that. So I was like, this is strange. <laughs> I'm doing so much more less, so much less. Yeah. Okay, Lynn. So you get this amazing opportunity at WPT, right? And you made this transition into the poker world and poker news for a few years before that. So during that time, or even like when WPT called and said, we want you for this job, right? Were there ever times where you kind of doubted yourself a little bit? And if so, like, how'd you work through that? God, yes. I still doubt myself constantly. Um, yeah, I was terrified. I mean, there were all the ideas of you're not good enough for this. What the hell? What the hell why? What? Because I mean, when I took the job for WPT, they, they moved me to LA, which was also such a dream going back to this child who used to dream. Like I lived in Melbourne, Australia. It's near impossible to think that I would end up living in Hollywood. <laughs> um, and so, you know, all of that, like, wow, I, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm committing to this idea of moving across the world and promising this company that I can perform at a level that I was like, what? I can't do that. You know, so much doubt, but I just had to keep talking myself through it and, and going towards that scary path that I just keep trying to go to as scary as it is. I just have to keep moving towards it because that's what makes me happy. That's what I, 
if, if I, I just, I don't want to be bored in life. I don't want to be doing something that doesn't light me up and terrify me, but with excitement um, constantly and challenge me. You know, I, we don't grow if we don't challenge ourselves. If we're constantly doing something that's safe and easy, then what? Like we should just never stop learning. We should never stop growing. And we should keep getting faced with these scary challenges because that's just how we just keep getting better and better and better. Um, and yeah, so, but you know, and it still happens. I still, I still think now with acting as well, like if I'm even just going into an acting class, I'm just like, Oh God, I'm not good enough for this. And I am riddled with so much doubt. Or if I leave, I'm just like, Oh, what did I do? Um, it happens all the time, but it's just allowing yourself to fail sometimes and not expecting perfection. Cause that's something that I'm, that's a, 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 a gift and a curse for me is that I am very much a perfectionist and I am always, I'm very hard on myself with that which means I dedicate myself to do a very good job with things. But then when it doesn't go that way, I beat myself up and I just have to stop doing that. Yep. And listen, I mean, look, if there's anything to get out of this part, guys, like the best in the world at what they do, go through self-doubt, right? And, and it's okay if you go through it and you just got to work through it. It's a normal part of the process. Um, and, and rising above that is how you're going to grow, right? Yeah. So. And a good thing, usually the reason that we're doubting ourselves too is that we're we're usually comparing ourselves to people that are, are like where we want to be, mm-hmm. right? Because we're looking at, you know, sort of the next step or someone who we idolize in some way or someone who's had a little bit more success in whatever that field is. So then we're naturally going to then compare ourselves to them. So then we're setting ourselves up for failure because, hang on a minute, that's, where we, that's sort of what we're going towards. So you can't expect to just overnight be that. And, and that person had to take their steps as well. And so you just have to allow yourself to take those steps that may be a little mediocre in comparison, but eventually you get there. That's how you learn. That's how you grow and sort of look around you and, 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 and just compare yourself to who you were yesterday. And if you're better today than you were yesterday, then you are getting better and you're not failing. You're moving forward. Love it. Love it. Compare yourself to yourself, right? And that growth. Yeah. All right. So you got this gig with the WPT, right? You're frightened, but you are doing a great job, obviously. And tell us what that was like for you as you started going that was first couple of years with the World Poker Tour. Oh, it's a dream and it still is a dream. And it's never, I still, I still, this is my seventh year and I am still overwhelmed so often by how, like just so overwhelmed with gratitude. Like the people that I work with are amazing. The, the stuff that we do, I just love how much, how Adam Pliska drives his company. He just loves to throw things at the wall, try new things. Um, he's not afraid of things not working. He's like, we tried, you know, just let's just see what sticks. And I'm really inspired by that for my life too, you know? And so that I like to then now start to throw things at the wall, whether it's just a segment that I'm doing or something on Instagram, or if it's an actual business, you know, just let's just throw things at the wall and, and, that's how you learn if something's going to work or not. And that's how brilliant ideas come about. Right. Right. And we're going to jump into these business ventures of your, of yours here in a little bit, because I can't wait to hear those stories. Right. So, <laughs> so I will, I, I just want to say, I agree with you from the world poker tour standpoint, you know, fate is fate are the preferred cards of the world poker tour. And, and even me not being an employee of the company, just being a partner, like there is a, a true family feel like there really is the WPT family. Right. And Absolutely. And like, that's, that's a real thing. So I completely resonate, you know, with what you're saying about that. So here's a question though. When, when was the first time you met the poker boss, Sean McCormick or Sean, do you remember the first time you met, met Lynn in your paths working together? And, and maybe you want to share that story. <laughs> I totally know. I totally know where you're going with this. I'm totally setting you up for this. I, I, I've never told this story publicly. I don't even know if Lynn remembers this story. I think I do. Oh God. Oh God. <laughs> I was having so much fun sitting back, co-hosting, just listening, taking my <laughs> notes over here, thinking about things like how Lynn, when she was nine, you know, basically uh, was trying to set up her acting career. <laughs> and guys like me and you were doing lemonade stands. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like mowing lawns and stuff like that. Uh, learning cool things. Actually, the thing you talked about with your with your mom, talk about close your eyes and then look at the t- two avenues. That is awesome advice. I could totally see myself at a crossroad, just like, you know what? Let me close my eyes and just 
which one feels better. So I'm going to use that in my everyday life. Uh, awesome. But if you want to talk about the story of how Let's hear I the met, story. Right? Yes. Quit stalling. <laughs> I love your note taking, by the way. Very impressed. Yes. So when you see me looking away, I'm, I'm taking notes. So um, at least someone is. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I believe, I believe it was December of 2012, uh, was the five diamond event at Bellagio, which is obviously, uh, an event that we're all proud of the WPT and the MGM family yeah. are like, uh, it's such a, an amazing, amazing event. And it's been since 2001, you know, the, being a charter member for the world poker tour, I wasn't around then you weren't around then, but We've taken the reins with it. I'm still stalling. I, I feel like you're, you're going to call the, the I feel like you're going to call the clock on me. Here. It's, <laughs> it's about to be called. <laughs> so, December rolls around. It was actually my first um, event with the WPT as someone in an operations manager role, um, and. Um, I remember back then we used to have these and we still do to the day it's it's gone more digital but we have these displays in the poker room that had all the talent on them and there was one of Lynn and there was one of Vince and there was one of Mike and uh, all the other uh, Royal Flush crew everything so I happened to be standing by a table with the troops and like it was like an hour before kickoff I was nervous I'll, I'll be honest it was the first time you want to talk about interviews that looked really bad. I have some old like Janine Deeb interviews where I'm just like, I don't know where to look and I don't know what to do with my hands. And they were so bad. Um, it is way so, harder than it looks, right? It's way harder than it looks. It's so, so easy. I don't know what you guys are talking about. Yeah, okay. All right. All right. He's done what? Five podcasts. And we'll have a listen to it. Yeah, all the edits we do in this podcast. Oh, God. God. Forget about God. it. It's all me. So, so. I'm, I just happened to be talking to the troops, getting them ready for our, our big event of the year. And I happened to be standing by the uh, stand-up of Lynn Gil Martin. Haven't met her yet. So here she comes walking through the door, and I have my back to her poster, which is right behind me. And she walks up to me. We introduce each other. And, uh, and then, like, before the introduction even really happened, I kind of looked at her and then looked back at her poster and it was the most, literally, it's probably the most embarrassing thing ever in my career. I go, oh my God, it's you. And I literally, like my voice squeaked that high. I literally, I was mortified. I literally was like, oh my God. I think I sat in my office until the shuffle up and deal. I was like, I'm out of here. This is just call it a day. And next thing you know, I had to come back out at noon and stand with Pliska and everybody else and try not to make eye contact with Lynn anymore. <laughs> oh, stop. The thing that you're, you're forgetting, I was still quite new then. So Very I new. wasn't used to seeing a poster of myself. Are you kidding? So I was also walking and going, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I love it. I love it. And now I'm going to turn that into some kind of gif, just, John, so you know. And, you know. <laughs> it's a very cute story. I thought we should share it. That is cute. Uh, all right, Lynn. So I feel like we could take an entire podcast to talk about the World Poker Tour and everything you do there, right? But I think folks know a lot about that, and maybe we can do that, you know, down the road. But, you know, uh, if you want to see Lynn on the World Poker Tour, it's Sunday night, it's Fox Sports. Network. Right? Uh, Fox, that's right, Fox Sports Network. And uh, you'll see Lynn. She basically is the host of the show, the anchor of the show. She drives the entire show and does a phenomenal job. So, thank you. Now, let's move to these unbelievable business ventures. So, I don't know where to start, Lynn. I mean, you've got Tool and Tan, you have the Permaculture Farm, you've got the restaurant in Australia. Where would you like to start? Where do you think makes most sense from like a sequential story standpoint? <laughs> Oh gosh, probably just all of it bunched into one. I guess okay. I just have a bunch of side hustles because I just, going back to when I was explaining how I thought in high school that I wasn't a creative person. Um, and that's because I was comparing myself to all these people who were just creative in different ways and ex in like just exceptional artists, you know, again, so just comparing myself to people who were better in some way I just believed that I wasn't creative and gradually as I'm getting older and allowing myself to sort of judging myself less and allowing myself to experiment with different things, I'm realizing that I am 
incredibly creative. I am obsessed with creativity and it's all I ever want to do. And that's what I'm kind of learning as I'm going is that when it comes to like any kind of business tasks, the, the, the part that stresses me out the least that just feels so playful and fun is the creating, the creating of a brand, the creating of a website or a brochure or, um, uh, curating an Instagram feed, like all of that stuff that's just creating an image of something and making something look nice. That's the part I really, really enjoy beyond anything else. Um, and so really, and because of that, the, re- the reason I figured that out was because of my marketing background, I started helping friends with their businesses. So when my friends started small businesses, for example, one of my best friends, Laura, she started a, um, her own beauty business years ago, like 10 years ago. And so I helped her, um, build her website and her brochure because for me that was playful and I was learning as well. And then at the same time, she's getting this, uh, to help her business. And so I loved doing that. And so I started doing that for a few different things. And from that experience, then I started to actually partner with people, Mm -hmm. um, for different projects. And that's kind of how now I have these side hustles (laughs) and really my role in all of them is taking care of the branding, taking care of the image, the social media, the websites, uh, and, and things like that, because I, that's just the part that I've realized that I really, really enjoy. And oh, yeah. well, you're an unbelievable social, social media influencer. I mean, looking at your Instagram ac- account and Twitter account, like I am, I'm amazed that whenever I'm on Instagram, some type of content shows up. Right. And it's just like, you are constantly putting out content <laughs> and it's like building your personal brand in a way that takes a lot of commitment and dedication. Like, how do you find time to build that personal brand on social media? Thank you. Um, It's, you know, it's definitely something that you have to balance. I was just talking to Tony about this yesterday because you can see a lot of people today become obsessed with it, that it interferes with life and that they're not, they're just completely removed from so many magical moments in their life because they're not living it, you know, and they just, oh, quick, 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 I've got to get a picture of every meal that I take or whatever it is. So you've got to find that balance, uh, definitely. But it's just been over time, again, slapping stuff at the wall, seeing what sticks, what, you know, gets a good response and what doesn't. And and just then also the whole thing really is just for me and my uh, Instagram is just sharing the journey that I'm on. Mm -hmm. That's just what I'm enjoying doing. And, Mm -hmm. but then at the same time, still really enjoying the journey (laughs) while I'm in it. And so, you know, just snapping some quick things as I'm going so that I am capturing each thing, but then still being present that's a huge important balance that I try to keep and <laughs> to try to maintain. It's almost like, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's almost like whether it's a strategy or not, like you're just living your life, the magical moments are hap- happening and then you capture it, right? Instead of trying to force it. Is that a good yes. like assessment? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. It's so important. And, and then over time too, because I also see that as a, as a, um, another just creative outlet that I just really enjoy is just taking beautiful pictures and learning uh, photography, for example, because now we're all photographers. We've all got these incredible cameras on our iPhones in our pockets. Uh, So I've just enjoyed learning over time slowly how to make videos and how to take nice pictures. And um, so while that never feels like work, right? I wouldn't do it if I didn't enjoy it. It's something I've always just really enjoyed. And so um, it's just part of the, the playful journey that I'm, that I'm on. It's not a chore for me. Beautiful. And then before we get into the Tulum tan story, you mentioned that a couple of times you mentioned that you kind of refound this creative, uh, the creativity within yourself, right. Mm -hmm. That you lost. And I think you mentioned some of the reasons you lost it were comparing yourself to others or, or some of the mindsets of other people around you Mm -hmm. as you were growing up. Right. So what, what advice would you give people who maybe feel like they've lost a part of themselves even if it's something different than creativity, but who they felt they were and transition to something else and kind of maybe want to get that part of themselves back, like, or that were also deterred from doing what they felt so passionate about because of some of the reasons you mentioned, what advice would you give those folks? Yeah. Well, I actually, I think if folks are aware of that, then Mm -hmm. they've, they've actually gotten through the hardest part, which is figuring out that that is actually a, like that, that has happened. Right. I wasn't aware that I had shunned that part of me until I kind of discovered it again, sort of by chance, because I had moved to LA and I had this incredible job. And then I was like, Oh, I think I want to try an acting class. Cause I'm here. But I was so scared because I was like, this is the Olympics of acting who, what, what am I doing here? But I was like, well, hang on a minute. As a kid, I was always acting. And then I started to challenge that. And I was like, well, why did I stop? 
And it was when I figured out, oh, that's right. I used to get teased and I fell over on stage and it's all those things. And so then I ran a mile. Like I was like, hang on a minute. I'm going to burst through this fear that I developed as a child. So, you know, if there is something uh, that you do remember loving when you were younger, but you've kind of just gone down this path and you're, you're bored and you're not stimulated, then think about what it was that did used to light you up or what you do find to be quite interesting and, and entertaining for yourself that does feel like a hobby and not a job and ask yourself why you're not doing that. Love it. That it's just a simple, and maybe there was something that happened as a kid, or maybe you just have been too scared to go down that way because you're looking at the people who are experts already. We all have to start somewhere. So if you admire someone else and what they're doing or some other business, some other career, whatever it is, if whatever is playful and fun, do that. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> as simple go. as that. I love it. All right. So Tulum Tan. So, you know, this is one of the first discussions you and I had after like a WPT TV interview. And we were talking about how you were starting this company, Tulum Tan, or had started it. And all I saw was this just bright passion in your entire face in terms of like when you talked about Tulum Tan. I was like, wow, like this is real. Like that's... <laughs> a real thing so so tell us like tell us the Tulum tan story like what is it what's the purpose and and etc how'd you get into it thank you so my friend laura uh i had been working with her a little bit making her website for her beauty salon and uh you know over the years so i would help just with the marketing thing so i've always partnered with things like that and um so we knew that we could work together which is one very important thing about starting a business with someone and um I'm obsessed with fake tan. I'm a redhead, so I don't tan. So since I was a teenager, I've been using fake tan and it's just been a huge part of my life. So I'm very educated in it. I've tried pretty much every single one out there. So it's, I'm already an expert in that field. And obviously she is too. She has a beauty salon. So she's an expert in the beauty field and she kind of, she kind of realized this opportunity. Um, and she had come to me, uh, with the idea she had thought of because she has a salon where she does, you know, her spray tans and everything. And then she also coaches, um, girls how to start their own spray tan business. She'll do a whole workshop with them and sell a package with the spray tan machine and the, all of the tanning solution and everything. And she kind of realized, well, hang on, why am I just being the on seller of someone else's product here? I should, make my own because a lot of them weren't satisfying her either. She's like, I want to just do the research to find, to, to, to create a product that is perfect. Like that I really believe in and sell that, you know, have my own product. And so because we'd worked together a lot in the past marketing wise, and that's not her area of expertise, but more the actual beauty and getting things done and the operations is hers. And that's not mine. It just was a match made in heaven. So we both partnered in that and it was, just so fun again, right? It was just such a fun, playful thing because I'm so passionate about it anyway. It's such a huge part of my life. It's a product I use all the time and I know so much about. Um, when we were doing the research to figure out our, our solution and we were testing all of the different products, it was hilarious. I was in Mexico. Um, I was living there uh, at the time, this is a couple of years ago, and she's in Australia. And we would send each other videos like at least once a week because I'd have one color here, one color here, another on my leg and here. And we are like, okay, so this one was this and we have... <laughs> just doing all this research for so long until we could figure out the perfect combination for for our tan and now we're just so obsessed with it it's um it's just perfect because we both believe in it it's not something that was just oh this looks like it might sell it's just something that we actually really love and wanted to create well it sounds amazing like it sounds like you're doing similar to to what we did at faded spade like you're you're taking something that's already out there but can be improved upon and you're making the best version of it and it's stemmed from passion and purpose and you've spent a ton of time perfecting it like yeah. well done so okay so is it a business to business product is it a consumer product like how can people learn more about it well you can learn more about it at tulumtan.com and it's a bit of both so it's business to business that was our main thing because obviously she's come from the salon background and she had that that op she saw that uh, opportunity business to business wise and that's what we were going to solely sort of focus on for a while because the retail part of it wasn't our expertise, you know. Um, but it was pretty incredible how quickly we kind of grew in that way because we we had just only had the spray tan, which is a business to business product, mm -hmm. and not the self applicating one. I can't believe I'm talking about this because most of the viewers watching this don't care. Oh no, <laughs> trust me, you're gonna care a lot more than you think. Like I'm telling you, you're gonna, you're gonna care a lot more than you think. <laughs> 
but um, yeah, we kind of, we just sort of realized about six months after we had launched, oh, we need the retail product. And the reason was because that has the, the physical presence on the shelves in salons. It also has, we have the ability to send it to influencers and have that online and to have, because we're getting all these questions, how do I buy it online from mm-hmm. our friends and from, from people who are seeing it? And because we didn't have that product for consumers, we're like, whoa. So we did expand faster than we thought. And so now we have both the, the, the self-applicating consumer one and the business to business. Love it. I'm going to go buy my wife, Devin, some because oh. she also is fair skinned and likes to do the self tan every now and then. So you have a new customer coming your way. Thank um, you. I'd love and- to send you a bottle. No, I'm going to order it. I'm going to, I'm going to pay for it, but thank you. Hey, Tom, can you buy some for yourself? Thanks. I knew that was coming. <laughs> Listen, dude, it's the lighting in here. I actually oh, yeah. more cans yeah, than this, you know? So, okay. That's going to get edited out. And also, Lynn, oh. I'm, now, I'm now looking for a new co-host. <laughs> so <I'm> just, <laughs> totally kidding. I might know someone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, anyway. Okay. So, so talk about this journey with Tulum Tan, right? So you, you started with a friend. Right. Yeah. And how long have you guys been working on this? Um, it's been a it's been a couple of years now. Like it was a solid year of like part time research because we were working from a distance, and then we launched just about a year ago. Now, wow, that has flown. I can't believe it. That's great. I mean, that's great growth in a couple of years. So, so yeah. have there been any times in the last couple of years where you're like, oh man, why am I doing this? Or this is harder than I thought, especially through all the R and D. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I remember there was. Uh, this one time when we were waiting for our, the consumer product, the self, the self applicating tan that, um, our supplier, the shipment had gotten misplaced somehow and it was missing and it was delayed for weeks and it was just such a hassle. And as the creative, I hate that stuff. I hate dealing with all that operation stuff and the stress and knowing that I had customers that were, um, waiting and they'd been waiting for weeks for this thing. And, and that I just hate, I hate letting people down. I hate under delivering, you know, I want to over deliver. Um, and so, yeah, you, you know, there's little hurdles like that and there's always going to be challenges, but Laura and I work together so well in that way. We're very good at being able to calm each other down if we have a tizzy. <laughs> and it was, thankfully, we've never had a moment where both of us are having the tizzy. If one of us is like, oh, I can't handle this. The other one's like, it's all right. I got it. You're fine. I've got it. And that's been really nice. Now you mentioned uh, Angel before. Yeah. Right? And, and I think it was a while ago, I remember seeing some kind of post that it talked about how, and I related to it because of me and my wife, Mm -hmm. how you were going to chase a dream of yours. He was going to chase a dream of his. So, so talk to us about how important that support is, you know, from him um, and, and you to him, obviously as well, trying to build, you know, these businesses and kind of be on this entrepreneurial independent journey. Yeah, it's a the expensive pay uh, trade off for what we're doing is that we are separated all the time. We live long distance still, and going you know going back to the question about the doubt and like questioning, I do that all the time. I'm like, I like I'm I'm alone sometimes. I'm away from my the country that I love so much, Australia, and I'm away from my my partner. And but I just love what I'm doing, and and then that's just kind of I just have to balance it up all the time and. Um, and it's the same for him. And we both know that this is our prime to be hustling. And the goal is to just hustle hard right now and set ourselves up for a future so that we can, um, always have this freedom that we have now when eventually that we have a family and just, I just hope that we can live in the same country at some point. (laughs) (laughs) That would be a true test. Trust me. That would be really nice. (laughs) My wife and I both work from home and some days it's like, oh, but you know, it's, yeah. it's, that support is so important, right? So it's like my wife also chases her entrepreneurial dreams and, and obviously me with Faded Spade and Sean was talking about it too, the support from his wife. And it's like when you have someone, even if it's not a shared dream, but there's a support there for each yeah. other's dreams, it is really unbelievably helpful and just appreciated, you know? Oh, and I have him to thank completely for having these other projects that I work on, like the farm that we're partners in. Um, that's in Mexico. It's a it's a completely different to what we do. Like it's just such a like hippie idea. It's a permaculture farm. It's all about self sustainable living from the earth only. So we live this life in casinos playing poker, but then we have this this other business that's just so one with the earth. Um, and and I love that because that just it it just plays into the the characters that we are because that is very much us as well and but to 
to have this courage to be able to um, partner in things like this and play around with ideas like this and not just always say stay safe very much comes from him. He, yeah. he really pushes me uh, to, to just go for it, try stuff. And, and I, I love him for that so much. And I, I get so inspired by him too and watching how he juggles a bunch of different things with his friends all the time. He has a few different businesses in Mexico and um, I'm, I, I, it inspires me. So I just, I admire him so much when I see how busy he is and he's pacing around the house and he's got three phones and he's just <laughs> always working. And I love that. I love seeing him uh, thriving in that way. It's amazing. Really okay. So, so you're hosting, you're anchoring, you're acting, you are building Tulum Tan and now there's a permaculture farm. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's not glance over that. So tell us about this permaculture farm. It's tough enough to run one business and do everything else you're doing. How did you get into this? I definitely, I, I'm not running it in any way at all, but I just take care of the branding and the marketing. I just, it's a friend of ours. Uh, Angel went to school with him to college and um, he moved to Australia and he learned this permaculture method of farming and then came back to Mexico and wanted to start his own farm. And, um, he knows that Angel is very much business minded, whereas this guy that his thing is the farming. So uh, they, you know, they decided to partner on the farm and then um, I came in for the marketing. So it's kind of like this beautiful Angel was sort of like the finance guy to get some investors and help um, where, you know, sort of put together the whole business plan and the, and the proposals. And then I took care of like the website and I do all the social media. It's just a really nice way of, of playing, like playing together. But um our friend Jose is the one that very much runs all of it. And we have a very sort of uh, distant um, t participation in it. Look at yeah. you putting that marketing degree to work and the acting passion and all that stuff. It's like, it's all coming together for you. So that's great, um, Lynn. And it's then I think you mentioned something else too. Like, um, don't you own a restaurant or, or were involved in a restaurant in Australia as well? <laughs> And yeah, again, it's the same. My brother, he had this idea to start first to start as an ice cream shop. And um, he was working at the mines in Australia, which is a brutal job. And he had, it was just depressing and he needed to get out of it. It was horrible. And so he had this idea um, so that he could be back with his family to start a, an ice cream shop. And he, um, you know, he pitched it to Angel. We were all there on holidays and Angel's like, this is fantastic. So then Angel being the savvy, like, finance guy that he is he because being in poker he he it's such a great way for him to access different people who want to invest in different projects so he was able to round up some investors and um we all got together and partnered in that and so that ended up sort of expanding into then a restaurant and now it's got like a piano bar in it and I had like this juice bar at the that was connected to it which was so fun because at the time I was studying nutrition and so I remember flying home five times in one year to Australia to get this juice bar open and oh my God, it was the best year. I just loved it. I was in my parents' kitchen, just, you know, creating the menu, like doing all these smoothie recipes and juice recipes and um, chia bowls and all this stuff that just, I was obsessed with and uh, creating that menu. And then, you know what I also realized, this, <laughs> this was when I really realized my creativity actually was this project because it was just with my family. My brother and my father were both fitting out the entire restaurant and then I'd go and, and was pretty much decorating the whole thing and I was you know we were painting I was drawing murals on the wall and like writing the menu on the on the chalkboards and and fully like decorated the whole juice bar and I couldn't believe it when it was finished I was like I can't believe that we did this <laughs> we're all amateurs we we're all just winging it here and it just turned out so beautiful and that was that was just really really fun that whole process but I'm not there and not being there it was sort of hard to keep the juice bar to be everything that I wanted it to be. So that sort of ended up dissolving into the, within the restaurant. And now it's just this beautiful restaurant on the beach in, in Palm Cove, Australia. What's the juice bar called or what was it called? It was called juice bar with J O O C E. Oh, cool. Um, but now it's, it's my, my nephew's names, Jack and Shannon's it's called Jack and Shannon's. Could you, could you take that concept and make like an independent type juice bar model? Well, that was the plan and that's the why we set it up that way. So we set it up with the two, um, the two different brands so that I could expand it and like maybe bring it to Vegas or LA because that's where I, I was most of the time. But I just, this, it really made me realize how much work goes into it and me not being there physically, it just couldn't be 
what I really like. You need to be there. You have to be there in person. You can't expect other people to have the same vision as you or to understand the same it, the, the same thing that you're trying to, to make because everyone has their own way of doing things. So it just was so hard. It's, it's a very hard business to get into. You mentioned getting in with family. What advice would you give people who are getting into business like with their family members? Don't do it. <laughs> 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 Words of wisdom from Lynn Gil Martin on the Faded Spade podcast. <laughs> no, you know what? It's uh, getting into business with friends and family. It's uh, it's it's challenging because you your personality plays out in a very different way in business as it then it does in a personal relationship. So you know, you might have a really good time with someone, like you might have a friend that you have a good laugh with all the time. Um. And then think, oh, that'll be great. Like when you go into business together and that doesn't necessarily play out very well if they're the good time person. And it's just, it, you really have to analyze it well to make sure that you gel together. Like, like I was explaining with Laura and I, that we had these personalities that really complement each other in terms of business, you know? And so, yeah, but anyway, but um, yeah, just really understanding the personality traits and how they will translate into a business sense is so vital because if you are partnering with someone in business um, and it didn't go well, you're risking that friendship or that relationship, you know? Yep. Good advice. Sure. Very good advice. So, all right. So looking back on this whole journey of yours, right? Um, what are you like most proud of? Like what success, what are you most proud of about your yourself or, or what accomplishments stand out to you as something you're really, really proud of? Ooh. Is sort of being able to look at the whole journey and realizing that I had these outrageous dreams as a child and I made them happen. <laughs> and it, it just seemed when I look back, like it just, it seemed so outrageous and it has happened, which now gives me courage to continue to have outrageous goals and trust that I'll be able to make them happen. Amazing. Right? Like it's about having that vision and, and even if it, you don't think it could be possible. If you don't have that vision, you don't start taking baby steps to reach that vision. You'll never know. Yeah. Right. And I think that's just an amazing journey you've been on. So through this journey, like what are some of the most important lessons you've learned about yourself? That I'm a creative person. There it is. <laughs> that's the most important lesson that I enjoy so much. And I'm really making sure I just think, incorporate that into my entire life. My favorite quote actually is um, by Elena Bonham Carter. It's life is art. Everything in life is art. The way I make my tea, the way I write my shopping list, the way I put on an event, it doesn't matter what it is, the way I, you know, if you just look at everything as a creative process, it makes life so much more fun and you don't take yourself so seriously. And all of these things that I've been talking to you about have, have been responsible for teaching me that I am a creative person and I can look at life in an artistic way. Love it. And then as we wrap this up, Lynn, like if there's one thing you'd want other aspiring entrepreneurs to know, right. And, and you definitely are like the definition of an entrepreneur, not just from running your own business, but everything else you're doing is very independent, right? It's, it's self-made, right? So, so what's one thing you'd want aspiring entrepreneurs to know? What would that be? for their journey? Hmm. Just do it if it lights you up. Don't do it just to chase money because you'll be miserable. Do what lights you up. I love it. Do what lights you up. That's going to be one of the quotes on our first social media tweet, which we'll call you for <laughs> advice about when we promote this thing. Apparently, like I've got to start calling you for marketing advice because you're killing it. And uh Thanks. Um, we could, I'm sure, use some of that advice at Faded Spade. So. You're killing it too. You're doing a great job. Anyway, but thank you. So, okay, Lynn. So to wrap this whole thing up, Tulum Tan. Where can people go get themselves a bottle of Tulum Tan? TulumTan.com. Okay. And if people want to learn about um, this, did I say this right? Permaculture farm. Where do yeah. they go? Rancho Uha. It's, so it's Rancho, R-A-N-C-H-O. Uha is U-H-A. 
<laughs> okay, I'm glad you said MX. <laughs> Got it. Got MX. Okay. And then if folks are in Australia, what part of Australia and what restaurant should they go visit? Jack and Shannon's. Okay. And it's up in Palm Cove in Queensland, a beautiful part of the country. Okay, awesome. Um, and then obviously World Poker Tour, Sunday nights, Fox Sports Network, right? And yeah. then Lynn, what's next for you? We are, we've been talking about vision, right? Like what's next for you the next five years? What do you want to get into? And and where does this vision that you have continue leading Lynn Gill Martin? Well, what really lights me up because it always has since I was a child is the acting. And so I've been busy hustling that part of my career and I have three films coming out. <laughs> Get out of here. So let's hear about it. Um, uh, so there was one, I went home to Australia to film for a month, which was one of the greatest months of my life. Um, it's an independent film. It's called How Do You Know Chris? I think it's going to come out hopefully by the end of the year. I'm not sure. It's such a long process, the post-production. Um, but I play this drunk Irish girl. So I have an Irish accent, which was very cool because I felt like I really connected with my roots. Um, and she's just a party animal. She's fun. She just has a good time at this party where she knows no one. It's a very quirky film. Um, and I'm also, I don't know if I can talk about this, but I have a very small role. I'm only in it for a couple of minutes, but in the new Dundee film. Get out of here. <laughs> Lynn, you're not going to believe this. That that show was, that movie, like one of the old ones, was on TV. And I literally went, holy crap, if they ever remake this, Lynn's got to play a part in it. This was like oh, a week and a half ago. Really? A week and a half ago. Like, I love that you thought yes. that. So, okay, so, what? Okay, so, great. So, <laughs> I, uh, I'm only in a, it's very small, but I play an American TV host. So you'll have to go and see it to see it. Um, and what else? And then, oh, and a Bruce Willis action film. Again, very small. It's called Trauma Center. I play a, a nurse in a, in a morgue. Oh. Which is crazy because we filmed in an actual morgue in Puerto Rico. And it was at a, a hospital that is still in use. So we had to do night shoots. So I was, it was like two in the morning in a real morgue. Oh my God. Yeah, it was, it was freaky. <laughs> yeah, it, was. it was pretty cool. A pretty cool experience, I guess. So, yeah. So is this your first time getting really serious about this? And like, yeah. Wow. All right. Yeah. So I'm pretty proud, right? That's my childhood dream that was so outrageous and it's happening. So I'm pretty stoked. We have come full circle on the Faded Spade podcast. Little Lynn's dreams becoming have been reality, right? And now even more becoming reality as she starts to have parts in different movies and whatnot. So Lynn, no doubt in, in my mind, I'm sure I speak for Sean too, that this is just gonna be the start of a much bigger vision of yours coming to fruition for acting. So we wish you the best. So. Thank you. Yeah, unbelievable. And Lynn, like following up on what's next, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the fact that you're gonna be back in your home country, continent, you name it, of Australia with the World Poker Tour. So how excited are you for that? I, like, it, I, well, <laughs> so I just blew up the microphone. I was, that's how excited I am. <laughs> no, like, I am so stoked because ever since I started at the World Poker Tour, the number one question I receive is, when are you coming to Australia? And I also constantly ask that, right? And so now we're finally, for the first time in 18 seasons, going to Australia. We're going to the star on the Gold Coast, which is the most beautiful part of Australia. It is absolutely stunning. It's like where surface paradise is and it looks exactly as it sounds. And it's just the surf is incredible. The beaches are amazing. And there's all these gorgeous... Um, sky rise buildings and just contrasting the, oh, it's just amazing and then the star the the casino they've just done like a i think it's like an 800 million dollar renovation or something i i cannot wait to see it and it's a brand new poker room it's just extraordinary i can't wait to get there you're it's gonna, gonna get amazing. that you're gonna get that same feeling like when you're just starting out your career right walking yeah. the, you know at the crown right and totally all right so you know what after this, I'm going online, I'm buying some Tulum Tan, and I'm going to go book a flight to Australia. So Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. My marketing uh, job is done. Done. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, gang, be sure to check it out. World Poker Tour, going to Australia. Check out WPT.com for all the information. And uh, no doubt, it's going to be just another awesome, successful stop on their international growth and domination of the World Woo! Poker Tour. 
All right. Well, listen, um, we hope that you really enjoyed this time with Lynn Gill Martin learning her entrepreneurial story, um, her career story. You know, as you guys know, the whole purpose of this podcast is to uh, learn from folks who have achieved success in their lines of business independently, right? And Lynn, I think this story really um, examples what we're trying to do here with the Faded Spade podcast during Founder Hour. So I want to thank you for coming on. And uh, hopefully I see you over here in the next few months at uh, one of the next World Poker Tour shows. Absolutely. And I love this idea. I think this is brilliant because the poker world is very entrepreneurial, right? It's, yeah, it makes so much sense. And this is such a great way to inspire people to sort of spread their wings a little. Thanks, Lynn. I appreciate that. And we did not, I did not have the vision for this six months ago, but it just came about, right? Knew nothing about podcasting. And, and the vision here is to do this for poker and sports entertainment and to tell those untold entrepreneurial stories of, of notables in, in multiple industries where folks might know them for one reason, but there's such a different story behind the scenes. And, and hopefully that comes to fruition too, Lynn. So thanks for joining us. I know you're running around with all your businesses and all your responsibilities. So you taking an hour, hour and a half to be here is uh, really appreciated. I'm on it. Thank uh, you guys. And we'll see you next time. Aussie, 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 oi, oi, oi. oi, oi. oi. Gone with more of the high quality podcast paper marker segments. Hey, hey, don't, don't hate on my high quality. I love it. It's, it's, it's uh, what we are. Here. You know, when you see, when you're speaking and you see someone taking notes, it makes you feel like, oh, am I saying something like really intelligent of importance here? And that's what you were taking down? That's what yes. <laughs> no, I took, I actually took notes and um, I, actually I took more notes from you than any of our other guests. Oh. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I've, de I've definitely taken a lot from you. I also took down tall puppy syndrome because I just wanted to Google that. Tall puppy, uh, you know, the poppy fields, the flowers? The poppies and they're all the same height poppy. that's where it comes from a poppy yeah sorry my accent so as soon as one shoots up you cut it down right the poppies <laughs> to all stay the same level that's how australians like to act that's why we're all so humble got it <laughs> got it got it but you're yeah. really irish though so maybe i should uh make another sign that says like erin go bra or something like that i'm impressed you know i am that's, irish too that's right yes of course so that's their name Yes, that's her name. McCormick. McCormick. Yes, my name is Sean Michael McCormick. Thought you were Doesn't down. get much more Irish than that. Um, I do have a cousin named Seamus Patrick, though. Uh, so he's, yeah. His last name is Gallagher, too. So it's really like like motherland right there. So, super Irish. Super Irish. All right. I'm Irish with a good tan, though. Not that I'm not considering getting some of the... the yeah. I'll buy two bottles, one for me, one for Devin, and we'll send you a little sample. Yeah, you, you need a lot more of it than I do. But Thanks, Sean. I digress. Well, hope you guys had as much fun as we have during the Founder Hour segment of the Faded Spade Podcast. We will see you next time. The Faded Spade Podcast is sponsored by Duck Duck Productions. Contact them for all of your podcast editing needs at randy at duckduckpro.com. Upgrade to Faded Spade and get 15% off the new face of cards with code PODCAST at FadedSpade.com.